He's going to tell us about the two-dimensional two spectroscopy for one-dimensional spin change with fractionalized uh, excitations. Yeah. So let's give him a back hand. First of all, I'd like to thank for inviting me to give a uh, talk here. And today I'm going to talk about, as Chairman said, I'm going to talk about the 2D spectroscopy in the 1D spin system uh, regarding the existence of the fractionalized particle. And yeah, so the title of my talk today will be 2D spectroscopy for the 1D spin system. And uh, first of all, uh, I'm Kivek Sim from Technical University of Minute, and my my works and my series of works has been done with the Johannes Kronle and Frank Bowman at the Technical University of Minute. And today I'm going to talk, uh, starting from the motivation, why we are focusing on the 2D spectroscopy, and I'm going to move on, then introduce how the 2D spectroscopy looks like with the spin fractionalization. And for the next part, I'm going to show the recent research from our group in the sense that uh, I'm going to use the, I'm going to show how to use the 2D spectroscopy to kind of like distinguish the two very similar model, which will be the transfer field Azim model and the twisted type model, which shows a very similar linear response or the neutron spectrum measurement experiment, but they will show the very different quality behavior in terms of the 2D spectroscopy. So that's the reason why I named the part as a spinal interplay. So the interplay between the fractional particle or the domain or the spinon will result in very different behavior in the 2D spectroscopy itself. And as a last part, I'm gonna show you how the existence of the a bound state which are formed by the fractional particle will look like regarding the 2D spectroscopy set. So motivation. So the notion of the fractionalization in condensed matter system has been given long time ago. And as you already know, because the electron carries the charge and the spin, there are two types of uh, possible fractionalization in the condensed matter system in the usual sense. And the first thing that I want to introduce is the charge fractionalization, which was experimentally first given or before the spin fractionalization itself. So the one very uh, famous example is the fractional quantum mole effect, which was has been which was experimentally realized around like thirty years ago. And to give the more clear plot, I kind of like uh, take in the recent uh, experimental data. And as you can see, in terms of magnetic field, they measured the resistance uh, through the x direction, and they was they were able to find the existence of the fractionalized particle in the sense that the usual charge of the electron is divided by three. And this kind of like state or the wave function is already well uh, described by the uh, Professor Jane or some other people in terms of this kind of like composite fermion picture. And little after the first experimental realization of the fractional quantum mole effect itself, uh, there was a, another experiment, which I named it as a direct observation of the fractionalized charge. And they do some kind of like more precise measurement or the shot noise experiment. And they were able to see that the charge here is actually fractionalized as a one over three here compared to the usual charge here. So that was the kind of like direct observation of the charge fractionalization itself after like 10 years, uh, after the 10 years of, of the first experiment of the fractional quantum wave effect. As I said before, the fractionalization can happen in terms of like spin at the same time. And to give the idea of the spin fractionalization itself, I'm gonna first introduce a classical system, which has the which has the elementary excitation mode as a magnum. So in this case, you can regard it the elementary excitation mode actually carries the spin one. And if you imagine this kind of like classically order state, classically new order state, then you can do as a theorist to the first thing Primakov or such kind of like techniques, then you will able to kind of like investigate the elementary excitation mode itself, which we'll call it as a classical spinner excitation. And people sometimes call it as a magnum, as a theorist. And if you look into the neutron scattering, or if you calculate the dynamic structure vector for this kind of like classically uh, older state, then you will see this kind of like sharp uh, dispersion of the magnum itself, or sharp dispersion of the classical wave approximation itself. Okay, But if you move on, and if you try to think of some kind of like quantum spin chain, or maybe the Heisenberg chain, antiferromagnetic Heisenberg chain, then you will see this kind of like uh, ground state. And if you flip the spin in the middle, and the key difference is that if you flip one spin in the middle, then you will see this kind of like two domain work, or two spin on, which carries the uh, fractionalized spin in the sense that each domain work or each spin on here uh, carries the spin one over two. Then uh, for some system, they can freely propagate, or for the Heisenberg chain, they try to pro they start to propagate, and this kind of like propagation of the of this kind of like two fractionalized particle start to make a dispersion 
And if you do the nutrient scattering or if you calculate the dynamic structure factor or two point correlator calculations for this kind of system, then you will see that this kind of like propagating fractionalized particle result in the existence of this kind of like continuum in the nutrient scattering or the dynamic structure factor. And this kind of like picture was also given for the type honeycomb model, such as like leucinium chloride. As at least people believe that the existence of the continuum can kind of like signal the existence of the viral particle. But the story, this kind of story can be a bit more complicated in the sense that if you imagine a magnetic system, and if you imagine the existence of the two magnetic continuums, this kind of like single magnetic uh, sharp dispersion can decay into two magnetic continuum, then this kind of like phenomena can result in the result in the fact that this kind of like single magnetic sharp dispersion can be blurry. So by just looking into the kind of continuum, in the nutrient scattering experiment measurement, you cannot really uh, directly signal, in some sense, the existence of the fractionalized particle itself. So then we start to uh, make a question in the sense that whether there might be another way to directly signature uh, the existence of the spin fractionalization itself. And what I want to say today is that we can actually do that. And actually, we have to go beyond the linear response of the system. So we have to go beyond the linear response, which correspond to the dynamic structure factor or the nutrient scattering, but we have to measure some kind of like another quantity. So, so to measure the nonlinear response, which goes beyond the linear response or some kind of like another physical quantity, uh, we have to first introduce the, some kind of like different experimental setup itself. So the experiment setup itself that I'm gonna introduce is called the 2D spectroscopy. And this is the experiment technique that was uh, first given in 2017. And I'm gonna show you how it works. So if you imagine one target system and within my talk, the target system of my uh, interest will be the 1D spin chain model with the fractionalized particle, okay? Then you give the two different magnetic courses. So for simplicity up to now, theorists have assumed that we only give the uh, magnetic field as a, a external process, okay? So we give this kind of like two pulses with the field strength A0x. So we are gonna shoot the magnetic pulse through the x direction, first of all, with the strength A0x. Then we wait for the time delay tau. Then we do another pulses with the A tau x uh, strength. Then we wait, also wait for the time t and we measure the magnetization of the target system itself. And uh, yeah. So just to make sure that I understand it correctly. Yeah. The thing that we mean by spin fraction fraction elimination yeah. is that your original system is spin one, and then you try to understand it in terms in terms of spin half. Or what do you mean by spin fraction elimination? So what I mean by spin fractionalization is that so if I give one example by going back to here, so if I imagine this kind of like spin one over two, so the so the Degree of freedom at each side is actually spin one over two. Okay. But if you imagine this kind of like one spin flip, then it means that you change the total quantum number as one, right? So it goes from minus one over two to one over two. If you flip one spin, right? Then for this classical system, they can make a kind of like coherent like classical spin wave like this. But for some quantum system, they actually kind of like behave separately uh, by propagating throughout the system differently. That's the water, that's the thing that I mentioned by the fractionalizing. So the situation below the spin that you yeah. described, this is this is this the, is the case with the spin fractionalization. The one that you yeah. yeah. Thanks for asking. So if I come back to the experimental setup itself to plug out the nonlinear response of the quantum spin model with the fractionalization. Uh, so we have a target system like here, and we shoot the process twice like here with the two pulses delayed by the time tau. And after waiting for time small t, then we measure the total magnetization of the system. By doing that experiment, we can actually measure the total magnetization of the system in, in the time domain. And actually we can perturbatively expand the total magnetization itself, which depends on the linear suitability and second order magnetic suitability and the third order magnetic suitability. And we are gonna focus on to the second order magnetic suitability and third order magnetic suitability, which depends on the existence of two separate pulses. Okay, so we are gonna just erase other parts and just focus on to these two. Actually, uh, the, sorry, uh, you will focus on the homogeneous response, yes, in the homogeneous field. 
So, uh, so first of all, we are gonna measure the total magnetization of the whole system. And the second thing is that this set of itself does not really depend on the size of the persistence. So the size of persistence doesn't matter, but we are gonna measure the total magnetization of this. So as I said before, we are gonna plug out this uh, second order magnetic circulity and the third order magnetic circulity. But the reason why and the way to plug out this second order magnetic circulity and the third order magnetic circulity is like this, in the sense that you first do the first experiment with the two separate pulses, as I said before, and you do the second experiment with the only one single process with the uh, with the second process only. And you also do another third experiment with the first process only. Then you subtract these guys. Then in the end, you subtract this linear suitability and the second suitability, which only depends on the one single process. And in the end, what you get is this kind of like nonlinear magnetic response or the second order magnetic suitability and the third order magnetic suitability, which depends on the two persons itself. So that's the way how we can plug out the nonlinear response of the system. And this kind of like experimental setup was actually first done by the Keith Nelson at the MIT in 2017 PRF for the Magnolia system. And to actually look into the existence of the fractionalized particle itself, uh, we first focused on to the minimum and exact model, which is the transfer field Asim model. So as already know, as many people might already know, the transfer field Asim model can be uh, is an integral model in the sense that it can be mapped to the non-interacting fermionic model, and we can calculate the linear response or the nonlinear response uh, exactly. So this is the how transfer field Ising model looks like, and you can do the Jordan Wigner transformation, which is nothing but the mapping the uh, spin operator to the fermionic operator with the without the spin. So this is the spinless fermionic operator C and the user uh, spin operator sigma. And you can map the spin operator to the spinless fermionic operator using the Jordan Wigner transformation. And in the end, the transfer field Ising model just looks like here. And you can do the Bogolyov Dijang transformation. Then you can map this model to the non interactive fermionic model itself, as in the BCS. Okay. So in the end, you get a single band with the dispersion lambda k, like here for the transfer field Ising model. So the transfer field Ising model corresponds to the single band fermionic model. And the dispersion or the width of the dispersion has a, a absolute value of the lambda k. And to give the physical picture, you can imagine this kind of like ferromagnetically ordered state. Then you can flip the one spin in the middle. And as I said before, uh, you create two kinks, two kinks or two spin ons or two domain wars. And at least for the transfer field, pure transfer field Asian model, this domain wars start to propagate throughout the system freely. And the existence of this kind of like two uh, spin ons or two domain work actually results in the dynamic structure factor or the neutron scattering of uh, wizard like here. And as you can see, the existence of the fractionalized particle or the domain works actually results in this kind of like continuum in the neutron scattering experiment. So in one sense, we can already say that if you can find the continuum in the neutron scattering, then it means that we have, we see the uh, existence of the fractionalized particle. Okay, but as I said before, uh, we are not really satisfied by just looking into the continuum of the neutron scattering, but we want to see another type of signature or in some sense, direct signature of the fractionalized particle. That's the reason why we are trying to look into the 2D spectroscopic measurements. Okay. And for this cartonation, I used the uh, uh, metric proc state with the open boundary condition with the second order TBD. Well, the only reason why I'm telling this all the technical detail is that our uh, result here uh, does not really depend on the numerical error itself. And as I said before, the reason why we first focus on the transfer field Ising model is that it's exact. So in the sense that uh, we can calculate the total magnetization in the time domain itself using the Jordan Wigner fermionic picture. Okay. So using the Jordan Wigner fermion, we can actually describe the total magnetization of the system itself, like here. And very similarly, even though I'm not going to give the detail here, you can use the Kubo formula type calculation. You can also calculate exactly the second order magnetic utility like here. And as I said before, the quantity that we are interested in depends on the total magnetization of the system. 
So it does not depend on the uh, kind of like regional uh, response of the system, okay? even though the purse can be regional. So we, it actually just nothing but the three point correlator calculation. So the neutron scattering, the linear response uh, depends on the two point correlator, but the high order magnetic subtility, chi 2, that we are trying to calculate or measure actually is nothing but the uh, three point correlator as has been given here. Okay. And for the transfer field Ising model, which is the integral model, you can actually exactly write down how the chi 2 looks like. You can do the similar step for the chi 3, but I'm not going to show the very lengthy uh, expression for the chi 3 here. So, yeah, as I said before, you can get the chi 2 in the time domain in terms of the time delay of the setup itself. If I go back, um, the tau corresponds to the first time delay and the time t will correspond to the second time delay before the measurement. So in the end, you get the uh, second of the solidity, solidity in the time domain with the time dependence tau and t. And you can do the free transform and you can plug out the imaginary part of the uh, free transform chi 2. Then in the end, you get this kind of like 2D plot. And this is the way how we try to plug out the information about the system itself for the 2D spectroscopy here. And for this plot, you will see that uh, the, it's, just not, it's not so clear here, but please believe me in the sense that you will see the existence of the very, uh, very thin and very low signatures that appears here in the scale, in, top, in the form of the scale here. And if you calculate the chi 3, using the Kubo formula type calculation, as I said before, then you will see this very sharp and continuous signature with the width of the two lambda k. So this is the one signature of the existence of the fractional particle itself in terms of the transfer field Ising. And that's the reason why uh, Professor Yuan Wan and the Peter Armitage at the Johns Hopkins uh, kind of like focus on the 2D spectroscope itself for the uh, spin chain with the fractionalized particle. Okay? So I'm gonna believe, or I'm gonna tell you that this can be a direct signature of the spin. -off. So yeah, yeah. So so then, if you don't have a fractional extension, what do you? Yeah. Thanks for the question. If you do the same calculation or very similar calculation for the user magnetic system, then you still see a kind of like sharp signature like here, but this cannot be continuous. But you will see kind of like uh, kind of like sparse or uh, dots here. So the only way you get this kind of like uh, continuous, sig continuous signal is that the system has a fractionalized part. And those uh, the distance or the, the separation between these dots, are they open? Because that's also like right. the discreteness also depends on. Yeah, so the distance between the dot that I just mentioned depends on how the magnon dispersion looks like. So in some sense, if I understand this, the discreteness is of the magnon dispersion, then because it's continuum, continuum that you get the continuous lines. Yeah, that's that's the one simple way of under, understanding why we have this uh, sharp but continuous signature. Uh, the, so, but up to now, we didn't uh, include any kind of like disorder effect or decay effect. So the fractionalized particle can also decay, but within the very pure, clear picture, the signature will look like. But these guys can kind of like broaden through the uh, off diagonal direction, like with the disorder or the decay channels. Yeah. So, in even magnetic particles, uh, you can have this uh, continuous spectrum, uh, you can have two magnetic particles. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And that is from two magnetic continuous. Oh. So I, I so if I remember correctly, the two magnetic continuum, the freely propagating two magnetic continuum can make a continuous spectrum in the neutron scattery. But if they start to make a bound state, I think they will be discrete too. They will be discrete ties too. They don't have to be bound. <laughs> Just the two magnetic continuum. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, So it really depends on how, which kind of component you measure actually. So the two magnetic continuum can also, so regarding the neutron scattering, the two magnetic continuum can happen for one direction, but 
but they cannot exist for another direction. So if you measure the, let's say if you measure the xx, then maybe the two magnetic continuum can happen. But if you measure yy or zz, they can distinct, they can kind of like just vanish. And those kind of phenomena, similar phenomena can also happen to the uh, 2D spectroscopy. But in principle or in general, I cannot say that the two magnetic continuum will disappear. Two magnetic continuum will appear, but from my point of view, the two magnetic continuum, even for the neutron scattering, I think the two magnetic continuum, the amplitude of the two magnetic continuum is very small from my point of view. So I rather focus on the single magnetic dispersion and how they can be affected uh, in terms of the decay set. So yeah, up to here, uh, up to here, I was just giving the kind of like introduction in the sense that how the 2D spectroscopy kind of like is getting its fame in terms of the way to detection of the fractional example. And this was already given by Peter Armitage in 2019. And I'm gonna move on and tell you how the 2D spectroscopy can be used in another way too, using the spin on interplay or the interplay between the fractionalized particles. So what I'm trying to tell here is that 2D spectroscopy can be used as a technique to distinguish the two very qualitatively similar models in terms of the linear response. But if you look into the nonlinear response of the two different models, everything will be qualitatively different. To give the motivation why we uh, focus on the twisty key type model, let me first describe the history of the cobalt iron oxide. Actually, cobalt iron oxide, uh, the cobalt ions are the magnetically active ion with the spin one over two. So people regard it as a very good and very uh, nice candidate to realize the transfer field ion. And cobalt, not, cobalt ions are uh, surrounded by oxygen and they share the edge sharing octahedra. And if you look into the just the cobalt ion, then actually they look like this, uh, the lattice itself has this kind of like zigzag structure. Then people at the Oxford and people at the Johns Hopkins start to realize that maybe it, not, it might not be a transfer field ion model, but rather a different type of model. But from my point of view, I think it's very natural in the sense that like lattice itself has a, this kind of like zigzag structure. So there might be some kind of like type type interaction or stagger type interaction. Then the model they first write down from the seed paper from Oxford is that they have written down this kind of like twisted key type model. So to give a brief introduction of the model itself, they look very similar to the transfer field Isaac model in the sense that they have a main player here as a ZD interaction, but they have a subdominant player, which is the ZY plus YZ interaction. This is the reason why uh, people uh, call it as a fancy way as a twisted key type model. So to give a detail, if you look into this old bond, that you have a ZZ main player with the YZ plus ZY. But if you look into this even bond, then there is a minus sign coming in, and this looks like a minus ZY and minus YZ. And that's the reason why we call it as a twisted key type model for this, uh, in terms of these papers and us. And the symmetry is quite similar to the transfer field Isaac model. And there is a global spin flipping operator, which is nothing but the Z2 uh, operator. And additionally, the lattice itself show, has a glide Y symmetry. So this glide Y symmetry also plays a, uh, will play a quite a role in the nonlinear response itself. And the reason why I only write down this dominant guy and the subdominant guy is that up to here, the model is still integrable. So you can do the jordan Wigner transformation and one get the two distinct band with the dispersion lambda k and lk. So the if you do the jordan Wigner transformation for the twisted key type model in terms of uh, which maps the spin operator to the fermion operator, then in the end you get this kind of like two bands. And the reason why we have two bands for the twisted key type model is that because within the unit cell we have two sides. That's the only reason why we have the two bands or the fermion model. And this is the key difference between the transfer field Isaac model from the twisted key type model which they both have a very similar linear response that I'm going to show you. So for this twisted key type model, if you can calculate the neutron scattering reserve or the dynamic structure factor, then you, as I said before, we have a two band. And the key difference is that if you flip the one spin and propagate the system, the funny thing is that the dispersion has a two distinct dispersion relation. So there might be a lambda k or there might be L minus k. So the momentum is conserved, but the energy will be different. 
And if you calculate the linear response or the dynamic structure factor, you will also see this kind of like growth continuum, which can be regarded as a smoking gun of the existence of the fractionalized particle. And for this structure factor calculation, I used open boundary metric proxy state with the secondary TBD. But if I move on to the nonlinear response, the kite to XXX that I have just showed for the transfer field Ising model actually vanishes for the twisted Kitan model. This is really good in the sense that we don't, so the chi2 is the main uh, signal of the nonlinear response. And the, for the twisted Kitan model, unlike the transfer field Ising model, the chi2 vanishes. And the reason why chi2 vanishes is that we have a glide symmetry line. So the lattice symmetry, the glide symmetry itself, prohibit the existence of the finite signal for the chi2. So chi2 vanishes for the twisted Kitan model. And if we move on to the chi3, as I show, so as I show you before for the transfer field Ising model, we have a, a continuous and a very sharp signature, but we have a very additional signal that appears in the off-diagonal uh, or somewhere else. And the reason why we have uh, actually the reason why we have this kind of like off-diagonal signal is that unlike the transfer field Ising model, which corresponds to the single band model, we have a two band and there might be a possibility of the interband transition. So when the spin on or the domain or start to propagate, there might be some kind of like interaction between these two distinct bands. And this interaction or the communication between the two distinct bands actually results in this kind of like off-diagonal signal can be, which can be detected in chi 3 here. Yeah. So here, it's just some continuous point. Chi is the susceptibility of K equals zero and omega. Yeah. So this the final k is something different than something else. So to be more explicit, uh, the chi that I mentioned is summed over whole lattice sites. So it contains all the summation from the k. So 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 in terms so in terms of the neutral scattering, you have a k and omega, and for each omega here for the nonlinear response, all the k's are summed. So all the k's are summed, but the k for a and k for minus a, they are summed together to preserve the moment. So yeah, the question, sorry. Um, so this picture is somewhat confusing because the before when you show the SO uh, dynamic structure factor, it looked like it's a very small uh, transversizing model with the continuum in the middle. Yeah. Um, but what you're saying is actually, these bands are yeah. sharp quasi particle bands in some, some sense because you are making sort of making a statement that you are making some kind of transition between these two bands. Yeah, yeah. Right. So how do I actually understand? Oh, okay. Uh maybe it's better to go back to yeah, here. It looks like it doesn't look like top and bottom bands, at least in this uh, as scale. Yeah, so the signal, so in terms of the in terms of the fermionic picture or Jordan picture, the 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 dot maybe one signal, one point signal here, maybe let's say k or zero here, then it actually comes from the communication between uh k core two here and k core minus two here, and they make a signal here. Um maybe can you repeat your question, maybe? No, I'm I'm just uh yeah. So based, I, mean, I guess I'm, I'm not understanding this correctly. So this is just dispersion relation of some kind of uh, excitation. Yeah, at the about, left. Yeah, this is the dispersion relation. How about on the right? This is the signal that is coming from the two particle excitation. Right. Yeah. So. So so what 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 is that continue? So so I guess I'm I'm trying to understand that. Uh, are are there mm -hmm. infinite states? At the like boundary bands, right? So that's, that's another question. I guess. Uh, so maybe one thing that I can maybe tell you is that if you imagine the signal here at k equals zero, the reason why they appear from two to six is that all the all the particles in the in this dispersion, maybe let's say at one and minus one. They can also give one signal maybe at around six. And at the same time, the particle here and maybe 
let's say 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5 with the momentum, they can also give the signal here. So, at the, so there are two particles. There are two particles that results in this signal in terms of this dispersion. That's the reason why there is a two lambda k, two delta k. So if you imagine, let's say we have a two particle here and lambda k and L minus k here. And the energy of the lambda k and L minus k sum will result, will affect where the signal will appear here. So these continuums are formed by the two particles, not the single particle. That's the reason why the dispersion is doubled from the band. From, so that's the reason why the frequency range where the signal appears is double from the band dispersion. Yeah. For magnetic case, it's different in the sense that single magnetic results in the dynamic structure factor signals. That's the reason why we have a continuum okay. for the fractional spot. Okay. okay, yeah. So as I said before, for the twisted type model, because the uh, unit cell is doubled, there might be some kind of like interband transition in the in terms of the fermionic particle. That's the reason why we have uh, this kind of like off diagonal signal in the nonlinear system. So in the end, so if you calculate the chi three for the transfer field Ising model, so let's go back to the neutron scattering. So the neutron scattering of the transfer field Ising model here and the neutron scattering for the twisted type model here looks very similar, in the sense that they cannot really uh, qualitatively see the difference of the doubled magnetic unit cell because they just result in the broad continuum with the two particle excitation. But if you look into the chi three here, because of the existence of the double unit cell, there appears some additional signal that can be small or big, depends on the microscopic detail. But from, from the microscopic detail of the, of the cobalt niobium oxide, we see that the signal is not so small. It's around like uh, 0 0.5 or 0 0.4. So we believe that we can actually measure this kind of like off-diagram signal in, for the, at least for the cobalt nabin So these off-diagonal signals uh, are coming from the interband transition. And this kind of like that, this kind of like continuous uh, sharp signal is actually coming from the existence of the fractionalized particles. Yeah. Uh, on the left side, you are uh, talking about trans isn't model in the transfer field. Yeah. Uh, have you made maybe some estimations or calculations? What will happen if we have uh, Heisenberg model? Okay. Uh, okay. What will change in that uh, lot of Im image and part of Chi, for example? So for the for the XX Z model, which is more generalized from Heisenberg model. Yeah. Actually, people calculate the chi three already, and they also see this kind of like uh, sharp and um, continuous signal. So, as 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 Youngjun and I already kind of like said, actually, this kind of like sharp and continuous signal can be just regarded as a signal that is coming from here in some sense. Yeah. So, for the Heisenberg chain, they also have this kind of like sharp, uh, uh, distinct signal. And this was published by uh, Masaki Oshikawa uh, in 2020. So, but they use the kind of like, uh, they more focus on the routine liquid. So it's hard to distinguish those kinds of things. So if you ask me by just looking into the Chi-3, can you distinguish the transfer field Eisen model from the Heisenberg chain? But then I think maybe you have to look into the Chi-4 or Chi-2. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because this maybe the U1 symmetry of the Heisenberg model can actually uh, result in the banishment of the Chi 2 or Chi 3 in the But for the transfer field Heisenberg model, we only have a Z2 symmetry. So the Chi 2 is also finite and Chi 3 is also finite. I think, or you can just measure, try to measure the different component of the nonlinear response, then you might be able to distinguish the two different models. Where both the elementary elementary excitations are fractionalized particles. So uh, I guess I'm already approaching the time. So for the cobalt nitrogen oxide, actually the model itself is not the pure twisted type model. They might have some kind of like another type of interaction, additional another type of interaction that can be written as a spin-on interaction terms. 
So that's the reason why uh, we go beyond the Jordan Migona picture and do some kind of like MPS calculation, which can actually handle the interacting model. And let me just skip all the detail. And so for the cobalt iron oxide actual material, it's actually a twisted heat type model with some kind of like spinal interaction in the fermionic picture or additional interaction. So for that case, Jordan Migona fermionic formulation actually fails because the model becomes non-integrable. And in the non integral model, actually we use the MPS calculation to be more explicit, infinite metric product six simulation. And we were able to calculate the chi to YYY. And the reason why we calculate the chi to YYY rather than XXX is that if you really look into the cobalt nitrogen oxide itself, actually there is some kind of like finite tilting between the uh, crystal A axis and the local X axis. So the crystal A axis is not perfectly aligned to the local X axis. So the measurement of the X component is very hard. So that's the reason why we select the Y component, which is perfectly aligned with the crystal axis speed. So we can just shoot the process very easily and control the system very easily. So there's a finite tilting angle, phi, which is around like 31 angle. Then we calculate the chi to Y, Y, Y. And unlike the transfer field Ising model, the twisted key type model with additional spinal interaction, we still see the existence of this kind of like off-back and signal. Yeah. Even though the signal can be a bit weaker than we expected. So yeah, so rather than that, I also uh, wanted to see how the, how the 2D spectroscopy really looks like if the fractionalized particle will start to make a bounce. So if I go back to the transfer field Ising model up to here, the model, they don't have any kind of like bound state, but they have only the freely propagating quasi particle. But if you include this kind of like longitudinal field to the model, then the freely propagating particles start to have an attraction between each other. So they start to make a kind of like bound state by including the, this kind of like longitudinal field. Then with the longitudinal field and the model become non integrable but they, in physically, they introduce the linear confining potential between the spin-on and using the IMPS, as I introduced before, we obtain the exact uh, imaginary chi to XXX. So this is the picture that is the, this is the data of the chi 2 from the transfer field Ising model, which is, the, which is the case where the particles are not confined. So we were able to see only very small scale guys, but when the particles start to be confined or weakly confined up to here, they start to become very strong signal. And as you can see, uh, you see this kind of like emergence of the off-diagonal signal. And this off-diagonal signal is actually coming from the existence of the bound state. And this can be easily looped by introducing some analytic technique, which is called the two-king subspace approach. So you can just project this uh, transfer field Hamiltonian, transfer field Ising Hamiltonian with the longitudinal field to the two king subspace. So you are reducing the Hilbert space of the system itself. And you can write down the Hamiltonian in terms of the uh, kink model. So the notation of the kink model is that up to site J, you have a, a fully polarized up state. And from the J to J plus L minus one, you have a down state. And then you have an up state again. So this is the two king subspace eigenstate in the sense that you have only the two domain words here and here. Then you can calculate the chi two within this uh, reduced Hilbert space, and you will see the signal like here. And you can also calculate the energy dispersion of this kind of like bound state. And you will see that the lowest energy corresponds to the E1P and E2P. And the reason why this off-diagonal signal is coming is actually the communication between the interband transition. Okay. So you will see this kind of like off-diagonal signal. And if you do the IMPS or exact calculation, you will see that this off-diagonal signal is not so small, but quite large. Okay, so to conclude, uh, I first focus on the integrable model, which provides a fertile ground to test the new ideas. So you want to focus on the transfer field Ising model to actually argue the existence of the fractional particle. And me and Frank and Johannes, we wanted to see what we can do more with the 2D spectroscopy itself. And we found out that the 2D spectroscopy can be used to distinguish the microscopically very similar model using the nonlinear spectros using the nonlinear response of the system. 
What we mean is that the transfer field Ajin model, the twisted guitar model, which has a very similar, uh, which has a qualitatively similar linear response, they actually can have a very different, qualitatively different signal uh, regarding the nonlinear response or the higher order magnetic because of the existence of the double the magnetic unit cell. And as a theorist, what we can do more, we can actually try to calculate some nonlinear spectroscopy for the 2D cases where the fractional particle exists. And our dream or our hope is that can we also detect some braiding statistics of the fractional particle itself, like the fractional quantum mode has done. And regarding the experimental side, uh, we still, I think Peter is still trying to uh, measure the nonlinear spectroscopy of the cobalt nitrogen oxide. But I think uh, the assumption that we made up to now as the theorist is too harsh to actually uh, kind of like capture the experimental data in the sense that uh, up to here, I only include the magnetic process, not the electric field process. Either. So maybe the electric field can give some contribution to the response. In the so yeah, that's all for today. And thanks for the time. Yeah, thanks to uh, Quebec for the wonderful talk. And the session is now open for questions. Okay, one. Thanks for the nice talk. So uh, here you, uh, you introduced this transfer to the transfer to the transfer to the separate. Yeah. It seems like you can have a general model that can capture these two by two parameters. Yeah. So TKM has no, no transfer field. TFIM has no twist. Yeah. Can you just make a general model? Yeah, we can make a general model. What is the exact result? Yeah, so, so we can. Good. Yeah, exactly. You're right. So we can. Uh, we can. So to put it in a more simple way, we can write down the twisted key type model and include the transfer theory. But this off-diagonal signal is quite large, even if you include the uh, maybe transfer field up to maybe like five Tesla. So that's the reason why uh, we still believe that this off-diagonal signal can be detected uh, in the end for the cobalt nanometers. But yeah, you're right. So we can still do everything in terms of the jordan Magnus formulation, even with the transfer field for the twisted So uh, you also studied models that were in Yeah, but only with the IMPS, only with the metric process. Okay. Uh, so, so how this signal, how does it differ? Yeah, so I just showed the result and I didn't give the detail. So so let's say you do the same calculation for this chi to y y y without the spin on interaction, then this orthogonal signal is like 10% or not 10%, but like 50% higher. But if you start to include the spin on interaction term, then the orthogonal signal start to decrease a bit. And that's the kind of like phenomenological answer to you, but I don't really understand why it decreases and how, is there any way to actually make the orthogonal signal uh, stronger with some kind of inclusion of the spin on interaction or another. I'm not so sure how to maybe uh, engineer the system in my for my own interest or for my own profit. And uh, so uh, the time evolution, these are results of some sort of time evolution that you are doing yeah. eventually, right? Yeah. So uh, the time evolution that you consider is very large or like, I guess what I'm interested in yeah. is that if you wait long enough, yeah, you're integrable. Yeah, with your TBD time evolution. Yeah, will it eventually become like a signal for non-integrable models? Uh, that's a bit hard to say. So how 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 do you define similar? Like uh, I I mean like uh, in, in the signals <coughs> that you get for the integrable models, uh -huh. are very sharp, like diagonal so on and so forth. Yeah. And as far as I could understand from the chaotic models, the non integral things were more blurred out. Oh, yeah. So, so I was just wondering if I 
So if I how do you how do you define infinite time in your system? And if I wait for a very, very long time mm -hmm. with, uh, with your techniques and all that, then what happens to this this very nice clean signal? Does it get blurred out? So okay, yeah. So yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, I think I finally understood what you're trying to say. So let's let's first focus on the internal model. So I stop somewhere for this calculation. So no, I stop. Yeah, I stop somewhere. Let's say time equal fifty. Yes. Then the data looks like here. Yes. And if I do the same simulation with the large system size, like what I mean by simulation is that like anyway I have to do computation for the Jordan within the Jordan model. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say I enlarge the system size and do the time motion more, then this signal actually just becomes more uh, more thinner and there's no difference at all. So if you, so, so what I'm trying to say is that even if you do the time evolution very short, shorter than this signal, th this result, then this block start to become bigger, but that's it. They don't really qualitatively differ. The reason why I do the time evolution up to 50 is that I just wanted to show that this signal becomes more sharper and sharper. That's it. Well, what I meant was that you keep the system size same, but you evolve for more time. Then the problem can happen in the sense that the spreading of the Lycon or the correlation can bounce this. So that's the reason why we need a specific system size and specific time uh, evolution, the total time evolution. So that's the reason why uh, we didn't use the ED type calculation in the sense that for ED, as you know, Hilbert space is quite large. And the system size cannot be like 100, but just like 40 or 60. So the long time evolution is not possible. And you cannot put periodic boundaries? So you can do the periodic boundary function ED, but the problem is that the system size cannot be such big as MPS. That's true. So, yeah. MPS, you cannot do periodic. Yeah, MPS. So uh, to be more specific, I use the, something called infinite matrix cross state, but they actually can just mimic the period boundary. For MPS, if you really literally do the period boundary condition, then the one dimension or the uh, numerical cost becomes so large. So I think that's not a good idea from my point of view. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, if not, let's just break hands to the